All right, everybody, we're going to get started right now. My name is Michael Padone. And if you are here, first things first, I have to start things off with this. Okay. First of all, I want to make sure everybody can hear and see me. Use your chat box to let me know. You must be able to. Hey, Jennifer, thanks for answering that, that question. Uh, so everybody can hear and see me. So but let's just do this first. If you received a notification regarding this webinar that you signed up for it and you didn't sign up for it, I have to let you know that that is my bad. My marketing person is out on vacation this week. I'm still trying to recover from COVID. It's not an excuse. I'm just trying to explain my voice right now. I know this webinar was supposed to happen last week. Yesterday, I did the boneheaded move. I, was, I went to go ahead and send out invites and I uploaded, just trying to do too much. And I quickly uploaded the, the list of the wrong part in the Zoom thing, whatever. And I foobarred. All right. So I deeply apologize if you got an invite or saying that you registered for this and you didn't. With that being said, I'm glad you're here. All right, um, and uh, let's just move on from that if we can. Unless you wanna take a minute and just roast me right now, by all means, go ahead. Other than that, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's jump right on into today's session. Um, first things first is marketing title. This is 10 Steps to Turn Dials into Dollars. It's a catchy title, uh, but it talks more about uh, you know the cadences and things of that nature, which is why a lot of you are here. And the first thing that the, uh, the webinar promoter that we're going to talk about is how many dials should you, be, you know, should be up on your dashboard. Um, thank you, thank you. By the way, well, um, here's the thing: you're not going to like my answer, okay? Because things are dramatically shifting, and they're even worse this week than they were last week. How many of you are noticing the number of layoffs that are going on right now? All right, it just takes a second to go. I mean, you just, yeah, you can just use your chat box, right? So um, it, it, all you have to do is log into LinkedIn and in the feeds, you're seeing somebody's laid off or other people are laid off, things of that nature, right? <clears throat> the amount of individual signups that I've gotten for my own course where people are saying there's layoffs going on and they need to improve themselves, the company's not going to pay for the train, they're paying for it themselves, is at a higher level than I've seen in the last 10, 15 years. With that being said, when it comes to the question of how many dials should be on your dashboard, one of the reason why I say you're not going to like my answer is this is because it's going to be probably higher than what you're do you've been doing. And th at the end of the day, it's going to take action to work itself through these types of down scenarios. Now, I want you to understand something. I've been a straight commission sales rep for over 25 years. I've been through recessions. I've been through 9-11. I've been through the dot-com bubble, uh, you know, the housing prices, uh, you know, these things are going to happen. They're always going to happen. And the one way the top people survive in sales is that there's two things here, okay? Skill and output. Remember that skill plus output equals results. And even myself, I'm finding I'm going to have to start getting back to some basics where I can't rely on the low hanging fruit incoming. It's nice when those happen, but you have to increase your output. That's the only way to get through this stuff. Are you guys with me so far? I'll, I'll probably see a whole bunch of drop offs if, if, if you know, because that's not the answer you're going to want to hear. So the, my winning formula has always been this. When it says, how many dials should be up on the dashboard on a daily basis? Here's my winning formula. It's been this way for, for ever since I learned it, going back to a company that I worked for that when I was selling online advertising. And it was my, this manager that taught me this and it really made the difference in, in, in my numbers out of the gate moving forward. He just said to me, Padone, give me, you know, give me 60 dials a six zero. Give me 60 dials a day and or three hours of talk time. And I won't care what you do with the rest of the day. 60 dials and or three hours of talk time. That was the magic number. So when I, when I, when I adhere to that, plus the skill set that I had, I was constantly the number one sales rep month after month after month, even in when the economy was dying. And so there's a couple other factors that are going to be at play there. One of the common excuses I hear is, well, you know, sales reps can, can fudge their dial. Sure. This is the, this is, the one of the scenarios where that 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 you know cheating only hurts yourself right this is absolutely the case why the 60 dials 
and three hours of talks and somebody's asked you. So, so here's the thing. It's the level of output. First of all, I, unless you're using an auto dialer, right? Which I would recommend something like phone burner. And then there's inside sales.com to have them. And the, there's so many other companies that have them, right? But unless you're using an, an auto dialer, the reason why $60 a day is perfect is because if you're making more than $60 a day on average, that's a red flag to me. So like the hundred dollars a day is out. Okay. So that hopefully that's the good news for you guys. And I'm going to say the hundred dollars a day is out because here's the thing. If you're making a hundred dollars a day, that tells me you're, and it's consistent like that. That tells me that your, your, your skill level isn't there to capture their attention. You're not having enough. You're not getting deep enough into the call. Does this make sense? Because if you were, if you knew how to get people's attention and get the conversation started, you wouldn't have time to make $100 a day. So if you're making $100 a day consistently and you're not hitting your numbers, right? Meaning you're not hitting the, the numbers that count. You're not setting enough appointments. You're not closing enough deals. You're not getting enough people in the, in the pop, right? Okay. Then I'm, I'm pausing because somebody's asking, is this topic only on inside sales and dialing? Well, it's on cadences. So we're going to get to that. But yes, it's inside sales, right? So then again, there's a lot of outside sales reps that aren't driving around just showing with today's gas prices, just showing up and saying, you know, hey, you know, can I meet? They're using the phone set appointments. But with that being said, it's the number of output and dials. If, if you're doing $100 a day, you're not speaking to anybody. Does that make sense? First of all, before I move on, if I said that, like, if you're just constantly making $100 a day, chances are, if you look at your talk time, it's going to be low, right? Yes or no? Now, some of you are on the opposite end. You're only making 10 dials a day, 10, $20 a day. Okay, I'm fine with that if you're hitting your numbers. I guess the question is, are you hitting your numbers? If, if, if you're hitting your, if you're, uh, you, you know, uh, if you're hitting your numbers and don't change, that, that's totally fine. If you have enough low hanging fruit or you got a system in place where that, 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 that $10 a day or $20 a day or $30 a day is, 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 is working for you, that's fine. But um, if it's not and you're looking for answers, I'm, I'm here to tell you as a straight commission sales rep who has survived all of these economic downturns over you know, almost three decades, I mean, does that give me some credibility? What was the what was this what was the one thing that that allowed me to survive during those downtimes, right? And it was one, I had the the sales skills, but two, I had to increase that 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 output. And then, as you know, inbound leads and low hanging fruit, you know, is there? You don't have to make as many dials, right? You're still hitting your numbers. You're doing less output. The problem is, is I feel a lot of us, you know, hey, myself included, you know, recently. Things were really good, and now things have been struggling a little bit, and they they seem to be getting you know it's going to get rough. You can survive it though, but you're going to have to increase your output if you're not making at least sixty dollars a day. That and somebody's asking, so so um, you know sixty dollars a day. Why is that the magic number? So it, it's just a combination of things. It's sixty dollars a day and or three hours of talk time, and then we're going to get into the the cadences. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to share a couple of them with you, which is really what this is about. But I think with, you know, again, just me logging in today and on LinkedIn and seeing more layoffs and people scrambling that they're, like, the sales reps have lost their jobs, they're looking for new things. Uh, here's the deal. I want to talk about this a little bit. The $60 a day and the three hours of talk time is so important because one, $60 is going to be the number of output that if you're constantly dialing, chances are you will hit three hours of talk time by, by, by default. With that being said, there's going to be times where you do sixty dollars a day and you only have an hour of talk time. It's just the way that, you know that you know dems the breaks, right? That's just the way the cookie crumbled that specific day. But you did enough output where you you know you you made enough outreach, sent enough, left enough voicemail, sent enough emails after the voicemail. Hopefully, you're following that pattern, right? To where it's going to pay off for you. There's going to be other times you only had you only made twenty eight dollars a day, but it's because you, that day you just had the golden touch, everything lined up for you. You're doing the output and you just got to hold this one person after another and you were able to get deep into the call. And so therefore you had, the, you know, you had the three hours of talk time there. That's okay too. What's not okay is, you know, it, you did, you know, 25 dials you know, or 15 dials for the day or whatever it is. And you had 38 minutes of talk time or 58 minutes of talk time. 
I mean, what'd you do with the other seven hours of the day? You have to ask yourself that. So you didn't forget how to sell overnight. Let me just say that if you're struggling, and this message for those, if you're struggling right now, you didn't forget how to sell overnight. Okay. So if you're struggling right now, chances are you're just, you have to increase your, your output. Okay. So with that being said, let's talk about cadences. First things first, there's no magic formula. I don't care what people say. It's such a huge, people are always looking for that magic form where they could just be on autopilot. Okay, if I set a, a call here and then an email three days later and then a LinkedIn touch, right? It's, first of all, let me share with you the number one cadence that I used to use. Uh, and, and, and going back to now that, like I said, things are getting a little tougher, so I'm gonna have to increase my own output, right? Is, is this, is, Actually, I want to back up for a second and just share this with you. So when I first got into inside sales, this was the cadence. You, you ready? First of all, we were selling to IT people. We were selling computer diagnostics. As a sales, com a sales team, we didn't even have a computer. So think about that for a second. This is, we're going back. There's a total like, you know, um, you know call center, th uh, think boiler room movie, right? We're making these outbound calls. We had eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. And you wanted leads, you walk over to the, the, the desk they had there, you grab a stack, come back, and you start dialing. And that was it. It was, you, you went right down the list. Call, voicemail, there was no, we, we couldn't send an email at the time, I didn't have a computer, just call, voicemail. You had to do everything you could when you, if you called, no matter who answered the phone, you knew that your chances of closing, you know, closing that deal, if you didn't get hold of somebody on that call was slim to none. Because you were just going to go on to the neck. You were just going to keep cycling through and cycling through and cycling through. So no matter who answered the phone, you had to be very skilled and you had to have the intention of doing whatever it takes to get that person who answered the phone, if they're not the right person to speak to, to get that other person on the phone right then and there. And then you just go on to the next one and the next one and the next one. And then I left that company after a couple of years, went to a, you know another company where they actually had a CRM system and things of that nature. And this is where I learned the $60 and or three hours of talk time. But they also showed me how to, one, they showed me how to properly prospect to build a quality list. So that's, I think that should be a given. You have to have a quality list. Uh, I would definitely take time to go through your list prior to, not, you know, not during calling hours. You're going to have to either set aside a time, do it during lunch, come and work early, maybe stay late one day and make sure you have that 150 to 200 uh, leads that, match your ICP, that should be a given, right? But then right now, I'm going to say the number one cadence is to continually cycle through that, where you call, you leave voicemail, send an email, then mark it that you did that, go on to the next one. And then when you get through your entire list, first of all, if you have 150 to 200 counts for that day, you might only be able to get a hold of, make 40 dials that day because you've gotten a hold of people. The ones that you didn't get a hold of, right? The next day, I would simply start that list again, start calling them. Now, if I've already called them once, left a voicemail, sent an email, I'm not going to do that again. I just want to put those in the in my high output where I'm just constantly down, just cycling through that list, cycling through that list, cycling through that list. That is what it takes when the economy is struggling. You have to increase your output on that. Like I said, I didn't think you guys were going to like today's session. You like to hear what you have to say, but I'm just sharing with you. This is what I've done to survive these downturns. Okay. Now uh, I'm going to answer a question here. So Eric's asking, do you think a phone call, email, LinkedIn connection is too much at one time? I feel like a three prong approach will get some, someone's attention, but my manager thinks there needs to be more of a cadence where you aren't touching them three times for each outreach. What are your thoughts? I think this is an excellent question. First thing is, listen, you're going to have to listen to your company, right? I mean, you want to follow company policy. I feel in today's environment, you have to be a little more aggressive. So what, what, what I, yes, I will send the recording to the answer. So with that being said, my process and what's really working for me is I call voicemail, send an email. I'll send them a LinkedIn connection. And if there's a, if, if it was a mobile or whatever, I will send them a text. Hey, John, just left your voicemail, sent you an email, uh, you know, and uh, let me know if you want to talk. That's something even that simple is fine. And then, and then moving on. Now, am I going to 
So that's right in the beginning. I mean, why? Why, why, why not? Because the reality of the thing is this, you have to know what kind of voicemail to leave, what kind of email to, to leave, what kind of LinkedIn messages to, to, to uh, send and what kind of text to send, right? So the whole goal is to get them to, to, to you have to pique their interest somehow. And so in order to pique their interest, you have to make sure you're contacting people that have, that meet the minimum requirements that would potentially have the problem, whether they recognize it or not, a problem that you can help them solve. Agree? Do we, we, we agree to that uh, basis, right? You should only be contacting people that meet a certain criteria that potentially would have a problem that your solution solves. Otherwise, why would you reach out to them? Correct? Yes. We, we good on those basics or no? Okay, so if that's the case, then why is it that we got in the habit of thinking that a one, three, five, seven, 14, 21, you know, is a magic formula for a cadence. The only reason why those cadences work is because it's a system and there's, there's outreach that all the salespeople are following. So it's not random. I, I, I want to open your mind to the fact that it's not that it's a, that's a, a winning, hey, if somebody touched me at one day one and then they contact me three days later, oh, okay, now I'm interested. It's just that you're doing output is what the real scenario is and why it's working because you're, you're reaching out to them. So if that's the case, then why wouldn't you just keep cycling through? Through your whole lead list. So let, let me just paint that picture for you. Let's say you have, a, how, how many accounts do you guys have on average? How many, how many, how, how many, how many leads or are, are prospects are in your lead list? Okay. I've, I'm seeing everything from five. I'm, that, I'm hoping that's a typo, right? I, I see 65. I see, two, uh, okay, there we go. I see a lot of you are saying anywhere from a hundred to, 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 to 500. Okay. That's perfect. Because here, here's the thing. Let's say you have, let's just easy round number. Let's say you have a hundred leads. You start and you're going to go, okay, I'm going to do $60 a day. First things first. Um, if you call somebody and you leave a voicemail and send email and all of a sudden they call you back, that's going to count as two dials, even though the, the second one's a return, right? So that's going to be on, it could, I really recommend that you're, I like, for example, we use um, uh, Ring Central. It automatically tracks the number of dials and your talk time, okay? So I would really recommend that. And I would set it up to where you get reports. Uh, this is what I, what I used to do when I was a sales rep. A lot of my, uh, I'm going to go off topic here a little bit, but hang with me. I think it's important. Going back to that one company where I was taught the $60 and or uh, three hours of talk time, the company had software set up to track everything. And the manager would get the reports at 6.01 p.m. every day. And a lot of the other sales reps, you know, hated it and complained about it. And they thought it was a like big brother watching them. Okay. I actually went to them and said, hey, can you send me that report at 1201, 301, and then can I get a report to 601? So I wanted to pace myself. So I wanted to see before I went to lunch, I had a certain number of dials before noon that I wanted to do. And that number was 40. That was my goal every morning coming in. I wanted to do my first time calls, not my follow-ups, not people I already spoke to, because those are easy. I have way more energy in the morning making first time calls, you know, trying to get that initial conversation is harder. So I want to do the hard stuff first. And I would do the follow ups in the afternoon, unless somebody booked a call with me at a certain time in the morning, that's a different story. Right. So I would come in, I would want to do at least 40 dials a day before noon. And the reason being was, do you know how easy it is to come back from lunch and from one to five, make 20 calls, like the pressure is off of you. Right. So that was my formula. So I wanted to get that report. So if I was uh, you know, when I got that report at 12.01, if my dials were down and my talk time was down, I was going to stay a little bit later. I was cut into my lunchtime to make up for those dials, right? And then at 3.01, I'd get that report as well to see, make sure I'm on pace to finish the day strong, all right? With that being said, I highly recommend, so we use Ring Central, and it has, a, uh, you know, an option that, that you can do that. So what you want to do is you want to go ahead and when you're doing these out, outbound dials, you're cycling through your list. Why would you, you call a voicemail, send an email, send a text, LinkedIn, you go through it. As you go through that list, you're going to get a hold of some people. Some people will call you back. Some people will email you or text you back. It might not be the answer that you want, 
right? They might go, hey, not interested, take me off, stop, contact me, whatever. That's fine. So now what you've done, and let's say you, you've gone through that list on day one, and maybe you get five people uh, that say, don't ever contact me again. You get three people that send an appointment with you. Okay, cool. You're down eight. So the next morning, what you have to do is you come in, you set aside a little bit of time to prospects to replenish those eight so that you get them back in the pipeline because you're going to lose some every day that you're doing this, right? Some are going to turn out to be an opportunity. Some are going to turn out to be a, a dead end. So you have to constantly re replenish your lead list. But as you're going through, so the second day you come in and anybody that you called yesterday and left a voice, sent an email, they didn't respond to you. You start dialing again burn through that list, right? But I wouldn't leave a voicemail. And today's, if I'm going to, I want to be very careful on this because uh, when when the economy is good, I will leave a second voicemail and, and, and as far as that goes. But when the, when the economy is, is struggling like it is right now, I understand that volume has to be key and you have to be leaving a message, sending an email, uh, sending a LinkedIn invite that is going to have a what's in it for them. Short and sweet, it has to agitate a pain, scratch an itch, okay? Because you want to get the conversation started. And you have to make sure you're contacting leads that potentially have that issue. And then you have to do everything you can, in my opinion, to get them on the phone. There's times I will call, um, I get voicemail, I'll leave a message and then hit zero or call right back and ask the operator uh, to page that person. Now, a lot of times people are working from home now. It's like, great, could you do me a favor? Could you send them a text? Let them know I just left them a voicemail on this thing. Or, or right. And if I don't have the email address, I'll ask them if I could send them an email. Who would be, you know, uh, what would be the best email address to send you? Well, I can't give that. No problem. How about I send it to you and you could forward it to them? Would that be okay? Okay, sure. This is where you just have to be more aggressive in that, in that area. So a lot of you, when you have those lead lists, back to my question, you have to, I would just start cycling through and, and, and get the volume up that way. All right. Uh, somebody's asking, we have both existing business needed to upsell and hunting for new horizon business. Do you approach it differently? So yeah, yeah, you, this is an excellent question. You have to segment the list, right? And, and you have to have call blocks. You don't want to mix one call with new business with another call with, you know, upsell. One option is to, is to just have, you know, one sales rep for the upsell and one, one sales rep for new business, right? That, that's always an option. If that's not the way the company is going to work, then you want to have it to where if you have to do both, make sure you segment, you, you create call blocks. I would definitely do new business in morning, right? Because again, because the, when do you have the most energy, honestly, morning or afternoon? I know for myself, I have the most morning, uh, most energy before, before noon. Right. So I want to do the harder stuff first because then it's and, and I want to hit that number of at least 40 before noon, because in the afternoon, especially if you're doing it this way, where you're going to try to upsell existing accounts, you're going to be a little more comfortable calling them. Right. It's more of a psychological thing, but you're going to be more comfortable calling them because uh, there's already some type of established relationship. And you, you only have to do 20 dials between one and five if you did your 40 in the morning. Make sense. So I, I would definitely break that break that out a little bit. Cool. All right. With that being said, what defines a productive day versus a non-productive day? Let's let's talk about that for a second because if you are researching during, if you're researching during calling time, that's going to be a non-productive day. I'm sorry. And some of you are going, well, wait. Everywhere it says, you know, you should research your prospects first, right? Send personalized messages, blah, blah, blah. Let me share something with you. If you build your list right, right? So the research should be when you build your list. Does this person, I'll share with you what you need to look for. You ready? Does this person work in an industry that has a problem that we typically solve? That's the first thing. So are they at least in an industry that you normally work with or would have a potential problem that you help solve? Okay, if that's the case, yep. Okay, they're in the right country that you normally work. With. Yep, got that. These are basics, right? Third thing is, do they have one of the top three titles? Listen to what I'm saying. 
Do they have one of the top three titles of the people I would normally need to speak to that can make a decision? You're never going to, you should never assume somebody is a decision maker based on their role. However, if you take the past 10 deals that your company has closed and you get with each sales rep, or you just look at the last 10 deals that you closed yourself and you make a list of the, the everybody's title for each deal that was involved in the decision-making process, meaning they literally had a vote, a yay or nay vote, not an opinion, but an actual vote, right? If you do that on that, your last 10 deals, you're going to start to see a pattern. You're going to start to see the same two or three types of titles showing up. So now when you're making your lead list, yep, this company's in the right industry that chances are it's a vertical that we've helped solve problems for before. Okay, and the person you're outreaching to, do they have one of those top three titles? If they do, then that's about is all the research you really need to do because if you know, I mean, who cares where they went to college? This is what cracks, this is what I think is hurting some people in the world. LinkedIn is guilty of this themselves. We've all seen their ads where they say, don't cold call, research somebody first, right? And then they tell you to go ahead and research and then they give the example that you notice that, oh, they went to the same college that you went to, reach out to them. So I got a question for you. What if you never went to college? I didn't. How's that going to help? Okay, what if they didn't go to the same college you did? You're not going to call them now? So you don't have anything to talk about there? I think LinkedIn as a tool is, is, is absolutely fabulous. But the thing is this, is what you want to look for is the key metrics of your ideal customer profile. Somebody said I, I froze. You guys still, am I still with you? You're still good here? All right, might, might have just been on their end. Okay, all right. So with that being said is, I think LinkedIn is fabulous for identifying, okay, I could pull up a list. Do they have this type of title? Are they in this industry? Are they this location? Because your business is only in business because your company created a solution to specific uh, a specific problem or problems. And you need to know what are the top two or three problems your prospect is going to have to have in order for them to be interested in what your solution is. Let me give you a perfect example. When I do my, my outreach, when I do my cold calls, I'll build a list of, 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 of companies that have a certain number of employees, uh, location, uh, yeah, annual revenue, uh, uh, industry, and then I'm looking for those people that have a specific title. And then when I contact them, I don't say, hi, we provide, you know, sales training, for, you know, because then I'm going to hear, oh, we already have something that does that, or we already do that in-house, correct? What was the problem there? I'm leading with a, a, a solution. Well, okay, they already said I already do it in-house, I already have something like that, does that, or just send me some information. That would be horrible. Instead, I call them and I agitate a pain, scratch an itch that they're going to have to have in order for them to be interested in what I have to offer. So instead, I'll say something like, and hey, the reason for my call is I help outbound sales teams overcome call reluctance. Let me just stop right there. That piques interest because that's if I need for them to be interested in what I have to offer, I need their team to be struggling on the phone. If everybody's hitting quota, chances are, you know, there's, there's no problem to solve, right? Do you see the difference here? So you have to know who your target audience is, build that list, and then you just need to pick a plan and go for it as far as it can. So there is no magic bullet. If you want one, there's a million of them out there. You just have to Google it. With that being said, what I would really encourage you to do is if your numbers are down, if you're struggling, if you're worried that your job security is there, you're going to have to increase your output. Take a hard look at the number of dials that you've been doing, and chances are you need to double or triple them. If you're only doing 20, 30 dials a day, you definitely need to get that up to, to 50 to 60, just by the sheer volume. Don't be afraid. In my opinion, again, you have to check with your, 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 your boss on this, um, but if you have a solution to a potential problem somebody has, wouldn't wouldn't you be doing them a disservice by, you know, spreading out the content over, you know, 30 days, you know, one, three, five, seven, 20, right? I mean, at the end of the day, wouldn't you rather know sooner rather than later, right? That you need, that you need to go ahead and, and, and they're not a good fit. Somebody says, so if you're doing 60 calls, how many emails are you doing? So that's a really good question. So first of all, you should have email already set to go. So my, my, 
I, I label it like this. So there's two types of calls. There's a first time call and a follow up call. A first time call, there could be 10 first time calls because what I label as a first time call is if I if I call and I get voicemail, I'm going to right, I'm going to leave a voicemail. I'm going to send an email. That email template's already written. It'll just populate your name. If I want to customize a little bit, I can, but I hit send. I'm on to the next one. I don't have to create the email from scratch. Why? Because I'm calling and I'm going to mention a problem in the voicemail. I'm going to reference my voicemail. Hey, so it would be, it would be like this. Hey, Eric, it's Michael Pinot at salesbuzz.com. The reason for my call, I specialize in helping outbound sales teams overcome call reluctance. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm about to send you an email. And if you like what you read and you decide you want to have a further conversation, you can just reply to the email or you can call me at, and I'll say my name and number twice, right? So then I already have that email set up, ready to go. Hey, Eric, just left your voicemail regarding how I help outbound sales teams overcome call reluctance. Uh, and then, okay, so let's just leave it at that, right? So the email there, it goes out. And then that's my first time call. Since I didn't speak to you, my next call to you is not a follow-up call because we haven't spoke yet, right? So I will label it, I'll mark it in my CRM, FTC number two. First time call number two. So once it's a first time call number two, again, in today's market, I'm leaning away from leaving a second voicemail because my volume is increasing right now. The, the market is dictated that I'm changing my strategy to be more high volume. Does that make sense? So sure, if you're using a, a, a marketing automation tool or like, you know, one of those auto dollars that have voicemail drop, if you want to create a second voicemail and have it automatically dropped, I'm totally fine with that, right? Not everybody has that option. So if you don't have that option, I'm just on my second one, I'm not going to send an email or a voicemail because I want to get more in the funnel. Now, one other strategy I have that really helps me, I use something called Yesware. Again, I'm not, I'm not promoting them. I don't get paid, you know, as, as, a, um, as a referral or anything of that nature. There's other tools that do what they do. One of the things I do is I will also have it to where when that email goes out, my initial email from the voicemail, I have a trigger on like within 12 hours or so, if I haven't heard back from them, another email will go out referencing it. And like right before the session happened, I got a couple of people that responded back to that second one before I even had time to make my second first time call. So I'm using a little bit of automation to try to help, you know, get those things going as well. Does that make sense? You guys with me on that? All right. So with that being said, so I'll, that's an automatic email that's going out with, you know, before my second call. So again, to answer your question, if, if you're doing 60 calls, how many emails are you doing? It depends on how many first time number one calls am I doing? Cool. All right. Listen, guys, this webinar is, is, is a little, like I said, we're, we're covering a lot of material. And I think it's because of, of, you know, like I said, the environment that's going on. So what defines, we were trying to talk about what defines a productive day versus non-productive day. I, I think that, that, you know, researching during calling time is going to be non-productive. So that's the, the point we were going to be getting on is when it comes to researching, you should build your list according to the, the, the your ICPs, your ideal customer profile. And then, once you have, you know, 100, 150, 200, 250, 500, some of you have, right? When you're doing those, those dials, as you have that attrition, people are saying yes, people are saying no, whatever it is, right? You're going to have a little bit less at the end of the day. One solution is to come in the next day a little bit early or stay a little bit late after your call day and just replenish what you've lost. And when I say lost, that also includes people that set an appointment, they're out of your, your process now, right? So with that being said, if you do it that way and you just now you're just spending 10 minutes a day in the morning replenishing, you know, the ones that are out of, out of the call cycle from, from the day before, you constantly have fresh water in, in, your, in, your, in your cycle. It's going to take discipline, right? It's, it's going to take discipline. And regarding the last thing, I'll just end it on this. What's the best inside sales case? The one is the best inside sales case is the one that has your that's working for you and you're, 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 you're pushing your limits on your output. Okay, in today's market, you're going to have to push your limits on, on, on the output. There's no way of getting around it. I mean, just, just that, that sheer volume. We all heard that sales is a numbers game. And, you know, there's also the argument, well, I do quality over quantity. That's fine. If you're hitting your numbers, keep doing what you're doing. But there's so many, I mean, uh, the evidence is online where people are losing their jobs 
And, you know, I think a lot of them, listen, no, unless you're a complete a-hole, there's never been a top sales rep who's just crushing that they got laid off if they're making the company money, right? You have to produce. You have to produce. And most companies are paying salaries plus, you know, benefits. And again, I, I've been a straight commission sales rep. So if you didn't produce, you didn't eat. Now everybody's making 40, 50, 60, $70,000, depending on where you're at as a base salary. And if you're not producing, you're next on the chopping block. If you're, if you're, if you're a company and, and you're having high turnover, okay, then chances are whatever internal, your, your product knowledge might be great, but it might be time to look into you know, uh, finding another source to train them so that you can lower your overhead cost of turnover so you get them to produce better. Cool. All right, guys. I know that today's webinar was just a little bit all over the place on this subject. Hopefully you found it helpful. If there's anything else I can do for you, please let me know. Uh, if there's any other questions, I'll take them right, right now. Otherwise, you can bounce and I will go ahead on. on uh, actually, there's I see a couple of questions I'm going to be answering here live. All right. Uh, so, but if you need to bounce, by all, by all means. So it doesn't matter how complex the sales, for example, data analytics, IoT. Uh, Nelly, this is a great question. So, uh, no, I, I, it doesn't matter. Listen, it's got, in today's day and age, it's going to be just as hard to sell, you know, data analytics, you know, uh, or Internet of Things as it, as it is logistics, right? I mean, it's, it's everybody is tightening their belts a little bit. Everybody's got to get lean and mean. We've seen this cycle before. All right, Nelly, another question, again, from Nelly is really good. Uh, thoughts on video messaging for prospecting? I think it's fine, right? So, I mean, the thing is, this is you don't want it to slow you down. It just, just make sure your message is spot on, right? You remember, every time, listen, let, let me share this with you guys. Your job as, as sales reps, whether you're a BDR, SDR, ISR, whatever you want to label yourself, right? Whether you're supposed to be closing deals or closing appointments, either way, your job is not to close every lead you come across, right? Whatever your definition of close is. Your, your, your job is to close as many qualified prospects as fast as possible, right? So if leaving that video message is going to help, that's fine. It's the message that's going to be important. They're not going to respond just because you sent them a cute video or you're trying to be personable. I think this is the thing that really um, is, is hurting sales reps right now is where you, you guys are trying to find what works. You see these things posted out there and yet chances are they were written by somebody uh, that was a content writer who has never made a successful cold call in their life. And right now you guys have to succeed at making cold calls to save your own skin, it, right? Not all of you, but some of you. And so if it's, I understand, it's like, it's like a, you know, even a, a, you know, a drowning person will grab at a sword, right? And try and save them. So I get it, but I'm here to tell you, it's just, just increase your output and have some basic sales skills and you're going to do fine. You can do this. Have the intention of helping. Have the intention of helping when you're calling somebody. Just call and see if you can help. But try to call and see if you can help people more and more and more. Don't be afraid of, of, of pissing them off. Listen, if, I'd rather know sooner rather than later that they're not going to buy from me. Right? If I call, leave a voicemail, send an email, and then they don't respond. And I call the next day, and then the next day, and then the next day. And then finally, they get tired of seeing my number pop up. And they go, and they answer the phone. And I do my opening value statement. If they say, listen, I'm not a prospect where you stop calling me. I'm going to thank them. Awesome. No problem. Listen, if you ever run into a situation where your sales team is struggling and you feel like you might have to have, start having some uncomfortable conversations and you want to, you know, head that off of the past, there's a chance I might be able to help. Feel free to give us a call. Right. So I'm just planting that seed and then I take them off my list. I can't tell you how many times I'll get a call back a day or a week later or sometimes a month or three months later goes, you know, I was thinking about what you said and, and I'd like to have a conversation. All right. All right. Another question came in. Um, somebody said, I manager rep who was a jerk, but his numbers were really good and I couldn't get corporate to reprimand him. Yeah. Listen, that, 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 that can happen. Right. Uh, there's always going to be that, you know, it's bending, bending, bending. Is it going to break thing? Right. So you have to outweigh the good with the bad there. Uh, la one other question. Again, if you have to bounce, go ahead. I'll make sure you get a, a copy of the recording. But another question just came in. What do you think of automated webinars to generate a set of qualified leads? How's that for output? I think I, I've built companies on, on that strategy. Well, I mean, what do you guys, why do you guys think you're here now, right? Why am I doing this? Sure, I want to help, but it's also a lead generator, right? It's also to, a way for me to help 
And then some, some, you know, out of, out of all the people that are here, somebody's going to raise their hand, but then we also, you know, we're, we're going to start reaching out to those that we feel uh, might be a good fit. I think this is a great way. And I think that the key though, is to have a webinar that's offering information that that's helpful rather than a, a you know, a half hour commercial. Uh, so I think you know, webinars is a great strategy, but here's the thing you do a webinar Yes. And if it's a quality and if the audience liked it, right, that's fine. Out of that, you're going to get a small percentage that's going to be a hot hand raiser. The rest, not so much, but you have to know how to pick up the phone. You have to know what to say after hello, my name is, right? You have to know how to pique their interest. Do you guys want the sales formula for, for success? I mean, it's a totally off the subject, but you want to know it literally is a step. Like for those of you that stayed on, I'm going to break this down for you. Okay. You ready? When you pick up the phone, you're, this is the, this is step one that you have to accomplish in order to get to step two. You guys ready? You have to peak interest and gain permission to continue the call. Think about this logically. If you cannot peak interest in the first few seconds of the call, you're dead in the water. Nothing matters. You get tagged out before you made the, at, at first base. Do we agree to that? Step one is you have to peak interest. Yes, I pick up the phone. I have to peak your interest in order to get to step two. Agreed? I'll wait for you in the, for those of you on, on the chat box. Matter of fact, I have a free course. My, my course is free. I'll show you how to do that, right? How, how do you create a, a customized winning opening value statement that's going to peak interest? As a matter of fact, um, you know, yeah, I'll make sure you guys, if, if you guys are interested, I'll send a link to you. You can take a free course on it. within 20 minutes. It'll show you how to create a customized winning opening value statement. Okay. That's what you have to do first. Now, notice I said you have to peak interest and then gain permission to continue the call. This is so controversial. What do I mean by gain permission to continue the call? Let me, let me share it with you. Okay. Hey, Tammy, this is Michael Padone with salesbuzz.com. And listen, the reason for my call, I specialize in helping outbound sales teams overcome call reluctance. And if I caught you at a good time, I'd like to ask you a few questions just to see if what we have to offer maybe is some help to you. Would that be okay? Now, if Tammy's a sales director and she's got a team of 5, 10, 15, or 20 sales reps, and some of them are underperforming and, and, and they're not picking up the phone as much as Tammy would like, Tammy's getting a little frustrated, Right. Tammy, it's going to be really hard for Tammy to say no to that. Agreed? So that's all like, well, uh, okay, sure. I got a second. Go ahead. Now, look what just happened. Peaked interest, gained permission to the call, lowered the guard a little bit. But notice what I did was I positioned it to where by gaining permission to ask them some questions, so now I'm in what you need to do next. So as a step two is once you peak interest, gain permission to continue the call, you have to ask what's called an engagement question. Because you have to understand, you're, so that there's four levels to the sales cycle. Openers, qualifying, presentation, closing, right? So peaking interest and gaining permission, I'm done with, if I, if I make that happen within the first 15 to 20 seconds or 30 seconds max, great, I'm on first base. So now I'm in the qualifying phase. And by the way, for those of you that are going, hey, I'm already, I already know they're qualified. You don't, in my opinion, you don't know the definition of qualification because there's three phases to qualifying. The three phases to qualifying, first phase is, is there a problem that needs solving? Because if, if there's no problem, there's no need for a solution. You guys agree? By the way, this is the difference between the cold and the warm calls. The reason why you guys love low hanging fruit, those, those inbound warm leads is because somebody on the other side already recognized a problem and now they're reaching out, searching for a solution. Now that person reaching out, they could be a decision maker, they could be an intern. So you, you, you can't make the mistake on an inbound just because they're raising their hand, just jump right to the presentation, send a quote out. You still have to follow the same call pattern, the same call process as if it was a cold call. Does this make sense? But so, so the first phase of qualifying is you have to see if there's a problem. You can't just call and tell your prospect you have a problem because they're going to doubt it. So what's, what do you do? Well, one, you have to know ahead of time, what are the problems that they are going to have to have that your solution was built to solve? And then 
you have to ask them questions that'll get them based on their answers to recognize if a problem exists. How do you do that? Well, you have to start with an engagement question. What's an engagement question? How do I create one of those? We don't have enough time to get into that, but that's the step. First of all, does that next step make sense? So you ask an engagement question based, and then it's gonna, by the way, you're not gonna get problem recognition on just one question. It's gonna take a series of questions, but you're having a conversation. When you peak interest, you gain permission to the call, and then you ask an engagement question. Let me, can I give you, you I, I know this webinar is going longer. Than, for those of you that are still on, do you want to see an example of an engagement question? Yeah, okay, so watch this. So, so there's, there's, by the way, there's multiple of them. The, the purpose of an engagement question is to place your prospect's attention on an area that you need them thinking about. This is the next step in the sales plan. This is why I, I can make cold calls and not have any call reluctance because I have everything mapped out. I know the plan. I know I got to, first of all, I, I call it the intent to see if I can help. That takes the pressure off. I'm just calling to see if I can help. They don't want to help. That's okay. I move on. Let me call and see if I can help. And I know for them to, 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 for them to be interested in what I might be able to help solve for them to be having a conversation with me, they're, I'm going to have to pique their interest first. And I have to gain a right and gain uh, permission to continue the call. Once I get that, I got to ask my engagement question. I call this engagement selling, by the way. Somebody asked me what methodology is. You know, if I, if I had to put a label on it, I would call it engagement selling because I want to engage with them. So I peak interest, gain permission to continue the call. And now I got to ask my engagement question. <clears throat> so I'll do the whole thing for you. Hey, this is Michael Padone with salesbuzz.com. Listen, the reason for my call, I specialize in helping outbound sales teams overcome call reluctance. And if I caught you at a good time, I'd like to ask you a few questions just to see if what we have to offer might be of some help too. Would that be okay? Uh, yeah, okay, sure. Go ahead. Well, so perfect. I, I guess my first question is, I think I already know the answer, but your sales team, are they are they handling inbound warm leads or are they doing like traditional outbound cold calling and prospecting? Now, listen to that whole transition right there, right? So they gave me first, like, okay, cool, listen. I guess my first question, I, I think I already know the answer, but that's all like, it's a transition. See how it's making, even though this is a script and I've memorized the script, do you see how I'm using those types of phrases to, and the pauses to make it sound natural? You guys pick up on that? Okay, so that's the first part. And then I ask a question, I put their mind in an area I need them thinking about. It's a this or that type of question. It doesn't matter what the question is. It's the purpose of the question that matters. That's why when I get asked, well, you know, your, 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 your training's on demand and is it generic? Is it just one size fits all? And I'm like, yeah, because it's the same sales process, no matter what industry you're in. That's why I have like 86 different industries that are all succeeding on, on, this, on this training program. Why? Because I'm teaching them what each step is, right? My, my opening value statement is going to be different since I'm in sales training than what yours might be for logistics or IoT, Internet of Things, or, or, or data analytics, like as an example. Or you, the, the, the problems that your solution solves are going to be different than mine. But the formula to create that opening value statement is the same. Does that make sense? You have to peak interest first, then gain permission. Once you do that, you have to ask an engagement question. The purpose of an engagement question is to place your prospect's attention in an area that you need them thinking about. This is why I feel, right? Um, yes, and it's going to be able to, to rewatch. Um, this is why I feel that that silly opener that's running around it's on, on LinkedIn and things of that nature, you know, the 27 second one or the 16 and a half seconds, do you have 16 and a half seconds to hear why I'm calling? The reason why I feel that that's a bad scenario, even if your prospects are saying yes is because it's now forcing, even if they say yes, it puts the salesperson in a position to have to do a data dump on what they offer. And nobody cares about what you offer until they can reckon, they recognize that there's a problem that you can help them solve. Does this make sense? So I like to use an opening. So my formula is very simple. I told you, for those of you that stayed on, I'll give you the formula right here. You have to peak interest and gain permission to continue the call, right? Make sense? Once I do that, I have to ask an engagement question. So my, mine was very simple. So you know, Liz, I think I know the answer already, but your, your sales team, are they handling inbound warm leads or are they doing a traditional outbound cold calling prospecting? 
I don't care what the answer is. The answer could be it's they're doing all inbound, they're doing all outbound. It's a combination. Or they may say, well, it's actually, let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Do you see why I call my system engagement selling? Because now all of a sudden they go, well, let me explain how this is. And now they want to talk. And now they're sharing what their scenario is. I let them talk. I take my notes. I go, okay, awesome. And now I go to my next question, which is the opportunity size question. The opportunity size question, very simple. Okay, so, so they, they're done sharing their engagement question with their answer to their engagement question. And I go, okay, awesome. Just like Justin, how many sales reps do you have? I need to know, is it just one? I need to know what the potential for the opportunity is here. Is it just one? Fine, I'll still help, but I'm not gonna chase. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time after them. Is it five? Is it 10, 20? My sweet spot are companies that have, you know, five to 10 sales reps. Sure, I have some that have a thousand sales reps, like 3M that I train. I have only one of those companies, majority of them are smaller. I'll help, but I wanna ask that engagement question to make sure they're in my sweet spot. Once I ask it, they, and I go, I care how many sales reps you have? Oh, we have five, we have four, we have three, we have 13, or we have well, two, three, but they just count. Well, then they might go, well, you know, we have some BDRs, we have SDRs, then we have some managers, and then we have some customer service people that do some of this. And stuff. I would probably about 15. I mean, these are the types of conversations that, that happen that you guys could be doing on your calls. If you, it, you're going to say something different as it pertains to your industry, but if you follow the same process where step one, peak interest, Game first, continue the call. Did you do that? Green light, great. Go to the next step. Ask engagement question. They respond. Yep. Okay. Great. Ask next question. What you know? Opportunity size. Once you get that, it's real simple to transition into, in, into the uh, the pain point question. All right. I, we're running really late. How many of you guys want? I'll, I'll give you the pain point question. Uh, an example. You ready? And then we'll, we'll we'll probably kill it on that. You ready? So I'll, I'll, back, I'll back it up for a little bit. So yeah, I'll start with the engagement question. So your sales team, are, are they handling inbound warm leads or are they, are they doing traditional like outbound prospecting cold calling? Oh, they're doing blah, 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 blah. Great. Okay, cool. Just out of curiosity, how many sales reps do you have? Oh, uh, yeah. I think you got four or five. You know, we have, we have, well, I have four BDRs and two, whatever it is. They say, right? Oh, I got you. Well, so here, here's, here's the thing, Anthony. I mean, the clients that we help the most, I mean, the ones that really get the highest ROI possible for what we have to offer, their sales team is usually struggling with one of two issues. It's either that they're, you know, the, 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 they have what I call call reluctance, right? Because they're the bottom line is they're just tired of hearing things like, no, thanks, I understand, well set, we're to use somebody, no budget, right? So their, their motivation is getting low and they're not picking up the phone as much, right? So that, that's one issue. The other issue is where they don't have a problem picking up the phone. They're making tons of dials, but the issue is they're just burning through good leads. They're not setting enough appointments. They're not getting deep enough into the call. Uh, you know, so I mean, out of those two scenarios, I mean, which would you say kind of best fits you, your team situation? Well, it's the first, it's the second, it's a combination. It's none of those, it's this. And now they hand me a pain point on a silver platter. You guys like this? This is, this is how to, this is why when I see others, uh, I, mean, I don't play well with other quote unquote sales trainers because most of them are, are like theory or pie in the sky stuff. And, and you could watch that stuff, whether it's free or paid. And, that, and when you're done, you, you can't pick up the phone and put it to action because there wasn't anything of substance, right? I, as a straight commission sales rep, could not afford bad sales advice. And a lot of times you don't know it's bad sales advice until it's too late. You burn through a list, whatever, and you didn't get enough deals out of it. And as you're a straight commission sales rep, you don't eat. You can't pay your family. Stress level is super high. In today's market right now, companies are looking to trim the fat and they're paying salespeople a decent salary. And if that salesperson ain't producing, now you're going to start to feel the pressure. Well, the secret isn't in a cadence. It's definitely an output, but you have to know what to say after hello, my name is in order to get the conversation started, to get the engagement going. And it's way less stressful when you know you have a winning formula, I'm calling to see if I can help. I know step one, I have to do this. Step two, I'm going to do this. And as, as long as the prospect's with me, we keep going to each step. You set a lot more appointments. You, fill the, you shorten the sales cycle. You fill the pipeline with qualified prospects that have the problems that you help solve. And everybody starts making more money. And guess what? You just got to increase your output. And then when you know, things start to swing the other way, which they eventually will, Okay, they eventually will. 
What you do then is you, you'll be so good when you can survive by, by making those outbound calls out just, and you use, and, and you perfect it. Just think what happens when <clears throat> the low hanging fruit starts to grow back and you're using that same formula rather than skipping steps. You're even going to sell even more. You're going to close even more of them because you're following the same process. Cool. All right. As I promise, this webinar is, um, <laughs> Thanks, Dale. I, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I, I was a little nervous. Like I said, we're a little bit all over the board on, on this stuff. But with that being said, as I promised, I'll make sure you all get a link to the free course. Uh, and if you just, as a matter of fact, um, I know I know times are tough. I'll make sure, I'll see if we can put a coupon code in there if you want to unlock the rest of the course. I'll get with marketing. If you're on this uh, training session and you were accidentally invited, right? Again, I apologize for that. That was my bad. Um, trying to do too much. I made a mistake, uploaded the list to the wrong thing. Instead of the invite, it was just automatic registration. I didn't even know that was a thing, but uh, hopefully uh, ho hopefully, uh, you guys got some value out of it and don't hate me too much. All right. Um, if there's anything else, guys, just reach out to me through LinkedIn or whatever, or you can always email me at mpadone at salesbuzz.com. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next time. All right. Take care, guys. We'll see you.